Hello, everyone. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. One second. I've already screwed up the, the beginning of my show, but hey, I'm still going to make you watch the intro. So <laughs> everyone who's in the chat room, <laughs> this is going to be hangout number 118. <clears throat> Things are starting off poorly. <sighs> okay. Can you see and hear me since I've already started off doing the wrong things? Just click the wrong button, you know. Sometimes it happens. So, can you hear me? Can you hear and see me? <laughs> oh Lord. <sighs> okay, I got a lot of things to talk about. I've already said hello to most everybody in the chat room, except for Emily. Uh, I think everybody else I said hello to so far. All right, nobody's going to see if they can hear and see me. Is that a yes? Okay. <laughs> when you have your eyes open. <laughs> You know, my sister still uses my uh, my my hangouts to fall asleep. So uh, she says she doesn't know any of the cases I'm talking about. And it helps her because she's she thinks my voice is soothing, which I just do not understand. But she also she likes like listening to me, but then she doesn't really care enough. So then she falls asleep. <laughs> yes, Joyce, that's true. Right. And I'm happy to help you out. It's better than drugs. So it's all good. All right. So anyway, uh, uh oh. What in the world just happened here? Hold on a second. Okay, weird things are happening. The heck is that? Hold on a second. <laughs> I'm having all kinds of technical problems. See, I do see you, Sarah, also in public, and I want to give you hugs and kisses. All right. All right. I'm losing my mind already. All right. So, <sighs> so anyway. Let's get to it before people run away. And if you don't run away and you do want to be in the chat room, please do click on the link below, which has the Patreon link, and you can join and be in the chat room for five bucks a month to eight different live shows. And if you don't want to do that, please just subscribe to the channel. Helps with the algorithm, helps keep this educational channel afloat. So subscribe, like, hit the bell for notifications, and so on and so forth. All right. <laughs> oh, Who's talking about Jose Bias? All right. So, yes. Okay. Sarah, I know you wanted me to talk about Shanna and Jose Bias being her lawyer and defending her in the case where she supposedly hired a hitman along with her husband to kill her ex-husband. And I am going to do that, but not during the hangout, because as I started studying it, it just is too much I want to do with it. So after the hangout's finished, I'm going to do a whole show on it. So just a, a regular video because I have too much to say. But I'm going to put that up this evening. So I am following what you told me because I did not know Jose Baez was going to be her defense attorney. But why not? She's like rich as crap. So it always helps because if I ever get nailed for something, that public defender, <laughs> it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. Um, it, it It is, but it's... It's not like we don't know what happened in this case and who's involved, but it, when you get to a court of law, it turns into a whole nother thing, which you're right. Maybe it's a hot mess of a case, so you might be right. All right. Oh, who who's Sarah? Um, Sarah, hold on a second. Uh, Sarah, Sarah uh, sorry, not uh, Shanna Gardner. Shanna Gardner case. Um, Shanna Gardner case. Um, and it'll be coming up this evening when I get to it. Um, but it was just really interesting. And I thank you for all your uh, things that you're giving me to do today. Um, you all think I know everything that's out there. And, and because I'm so busy, I really actually know way less than you guys. So I depend on all my patrons to tell me what's out there and what they're interested in. So it makes a difference. Um, and because of one of your requests, I'm going to do who requested this. Now, mind you, I have no memory for names and faces. <laughs> so not that I don't know you guys, but I'm a little like, who asked me for that? But I'm I'm going to do on Sunday, I'm going to do the case of Sophie, the murder of Sophie in West Cork. Okay. So if you're here today and you just said 
hope I, I'm going to do it, Sarah. I'm going to. Um, whoever asked me for the Sophie from West Cork uh, with the main guy that was um, uh, the journalist was the one who became the main suspect. His name is, see, I can't remember names and faces. <laughs> Ian, whatever his name is, Ian. But um, fascinating case. I'm going to send you all the information this evening. Uh, about the case so you can watch the Netflix documentary on it. It's a three-part documentary and it's really, really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I became fascinated. So I have, I'm have i going to be reading an entire book on the case along with the documentary. And I actually read in, what was his name? Is it Bradley? <laughs> I've lost my mind. I can't remember what his name is. Um, but I bought his book and I returned it. He, he wrote a bunch of poetry and it was terrible. So I returned it. But Anyway, it's going to be an interesting case on Sunday. Absolutely fascinating. And so sometimes when you send me cases, I get like, I'm like, I don't know if I want to do them. And then I start looking into them and then I get obsessed with them and I want to find out. But speaking of obsession, all right, let's get on with this before somebody complains that I talk too much crap. All right. <laughs> let's talk about, this is an interesting article about the, um, let me find her picture. Oh, where'd she go? There she is. And I've done, um, this is uh, Nancy Ng. She disappeared in um, in uh, Lake Atitlan, Guatemala in October, on October 19th, 2023. She went out, um, on, she went out and onto the lake and she vanished, uh, supposedly drowned. That's what the Guatemalan authorities say. However, her family, doesn't want to believe that she just stupidly, you know, um, she was, uh, you know, she's out there going along. Yeah. And then she says, Oh, I think I want to take a swim. So she jumps out and supposedly drowns, but her body hasn't been found. So I've done two videos on this case. And um, I did one because I have been in LA Catitlan in Guatemala and I wanted to explain what the area was like, what the lake was like, because I've actually been there. I've been there twice, actually. So I thought I could lend some understanding to the area. I believe she drowned. I do not believe there's a big conspiracy theory. Uh, and then later on, they came up finally with somebody who, who, the last woman who saw her, who said she saw her disappear um, and from her kayak. And I said, hey, he, this woman, the reason she didn't come forward sooner was because Everybody's accusing her of everything. Um, and she's just part of the group that was out there. And she she, she saw Nancy say, hey, I want to swim. And she tried to hold on to her kayak while she jumped out of it. And, and things went badly. However, there's everybody now out there on the Internet is saying, oh, this woman, who was a lawyer, by the way, in California, who didn't know Nancy before she even came to Guatemala. And she hardly knew her at all. She was just part of the group. You know, that woman over there, you know, not like you're close or anything. She's just part of the group. Uh, so now the guy who runs the yoga retreat in Guatemala and this woman is a huge massive conspiracy theory. Now I knocked all that down because I said, there's zero evidence of this. A lot of times people just, Lake Atitlan is a huge lake, very deep and can have bad currents in it. And sometimes you do stupid things like get out of your kayak, which you shouldn't. And she wasn't wearing a life vest. So not a bright thing to do. And she seemed like a lovely woman, but things didn't go well for her. But now it's a huge conspiracy theory. And I want to read this article because this is the problem with a lot of YouTube crap. So um, this is it. Uh, Nancy Eng disappeared October 19th at a retreat in Lake Atitlan, Guatemala. And TikTok and YouTube and every other outlet possible. But big on, on people who are YouTubers and TikTokers in the sense that they're not major news channels. Uh, so they can just go on and on and on and on about things and drop and pull people in. They're keeping up with every update, which there have been very few updates, but you know, they're going to point them out. Ng, a 29 year old school assistant from Southern California, had gone on vacation to a yoga retreat and reportedly was kayaking in the lake when she vanished. All right. Authorities believe she disappeared. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, just, I just helped those people out. She drowned. Mm. 
don't help out the crazy people on YouTube. All right. Um, but it says here, but a family and friends are unconvinced. When family and friends lose someone to a stupid accident, the tendency is to say she was murdered. That's just, it seems to be the thing. Um, I think it's because you just, murder seems like you can blame somebody else. But when you're the, you just do something dumb, it just pisses you off. You can't believe your own child would just do something foolish. I mean, personally, I, I've always believed my children could do something foolish. Sorry, kids. But, and I know I did some foolish things. I'm lucky I'm not dead. So I, I'm perfectly realistic about stupidity. <laughs> that, that we can do things you think, wow, lucky I'm alive. But somehow when, when people lose their child to suicide, they'll claim it's homicide. When they lose a child to an accident, they'll claim it's homicide because they just don't want to acknowledge that their child is unhappy or just did some really silly thing that cost them their lives. I mean, obviously Nancy was a, seems like a really nice person and had a great life ahead of her. And it is a horrible thing, you know, but, but, you know, you'd rather have her be hit by a drunk driver because you can say they did it. But if she does it, you think, I don't want to admit that because it just seems so wrong. I just can't handle it. You know, so this is what happens. But I understand why the family and friends go this direction. But the TikTokers and YouTube people are grifters. I, oh, wait, Benny, did you say I was going to go on a soapbox? You're right. Grifters. <laughs> I don't like grifters. All right. Meanwhile, TikTokers have been sharing every new interview with witnesses and notices from police. Okay. It's mostly the same crap all over, you know, over and over again, but they exaggerate that there's so much going on. Videos with hashtag Nancy Ng have amassed, get this, 36 million views on the platform. And we're not, we're talking about TikTok. We're not even talking about YouTube. Oh, Lord, Ed Choi, whoever the hell he is, uh, for example, has almost 500,000 followers. I don't. <laughs> I'm just jealous. Or right. has been reporting on Ng's disappearance since November 5th, with his videos regularly hitting hundreds of thousands or over a million views. Grifter. I'm not jealous. <laughs> Okay, I'm jealous, but okay. I'm okay with people being highly popular, having me, uh, a million subscribers. There are some people I'm like, hmm, I like them. I also subscribe to them and they've got a million subscribers and I don't. Okay, that's okay with me. But I do get upset when I see people get millions of subscribers and millions of views on something that I consider complete garbage. That bothers me tremendously. So here this guy, he's like, he's just going to town, doing this over and over again. Oh, now he's a, oh, it's now been 42 days. Now it's been 43 days. Now been 40, you know, that kind of thing. My thing is, if you're going to talk about a case, talk about it once or twice. But if you're doing 100 videos, you're a grifter. All right. In his first videos, he addressed some really shady circumstances around Ng's case. Sure. He's going to find the shady circumstances because if you don't find them like me, nobody watches your videos. <laughs> but if you find some shady, some shady stuff, yeah, you're going to get all the people who want the exciting story, the conspiracy theories and all that. They're all going to roll in and they make you a pile of money. According to, uh, okay, oh, sorry, there's, there's crap. God. So annoying. They got these, it's, it's business insider. They're kind of a garbage channel. So they got all these, these ads that cover up all the words. <laughs> okay. Choi and others have, have made videos reporting on every update or fake update um, about Ning, Ning's disappearance, including a video of her kayaking when her kayaking video was released. In other words, she was going off on a kayak going, bye. And when the last person thought to see her, uh, this was the woman who said she tried to say pull her kayak in and, tr and she just vanished. Um, and this woman came forward. I'm not going to say her name again because she's just being screwed. All right. The rise of arm armchair sleuths. True crime content is huge on TikTok with videos about historic cases regularly racking up millions of views. But internet sleuths have also played an increasing role in mysteries that unfold in real time. So 
historical crimes, you know, I, I, I get that, you know, nobody's, it's, people want to figure out who Jack the Ripper was and those kind of things. Oh, check my video out. All right. So, but the newest ones, when people exaggerate and, and bring forth information that's not facts, that bothers me. So when Gabby Petito went missing, that one insane, right? All right. I'm not going to read all that. Um, I want to read about uh, more about um, this fellow. Who is this fellow? Stony Street told B.I., uh, I guess that's Business Insider, the problem-solving element is something that attracts people to true crime, all the way back to the disappearance of Madeleine McCann or even Jack the Ripper. I get it. I get people like to solve crimes. I like to solve crimes. Um, I'm fascinated by evidence and what the evidence shows, which is why I have this channel. But a lot of people aren't interested in evidence. They're interested in every con piece of conjecture out there. Just n the most nonsensical stuff you ever heard of in your life. I've had people on the Jack the Ripper case go to my Jack the Ripper uh, video and, and say, this person says this one did. I'm like, there is like nothing that connects this person to the crime, but they're all over it because that person is fam or famous or I think the last one was um, he was a, what was he? A doctor or something. And he, if you're a doctor, you're a prince, you're, you're an artist, then people who are into Jack the Ripper want to think that's the person who did it. Well, as if a famous person who has tons of money is running around the bowels of London killing prostitutes. No. <laughs> but it's more exciting than what I suspect is Jacob Levy, which is a local butcher, which is just not interesting at all. But check my video out. <laughs> all right. Our desensitization to true crime due to our constant cons consumption of media means it's almost a challenge or a game game to solve these puzzles. It feels satisfying when our predictions or suspicions are confirmed as right. All right, I disagree with it. Nobody cares whether the suspicions are right because most of the time these things aren't, a lot of times aren't solved. And even if they are solved, and the, the detectives have come to a conclusion. People who want to be involved will keep going regardless because they love the excitement and they won't give up the excitement. And if somebody like me comes along and says, you know, I'm pretty sure it's an accident. Oh, you want to see how many hate comments I get? Why? Is it because I'm wrong or it's because I'm ruining, <laughs> ruining the fun? And I think it's because I'm ruining the fun. I'm going to stop there. Uh, that was my soapbox, Benny, because you told me I'd be on one. Wow, 96 comments. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, let me check what's going on here. All right. Um, let's see. I just want to check in here. Uh, they're interested in the drama. Correct, Clarissa. People like drama. They like a soap opera. Um, and you know, it's one thing to like a fictional soap opera. It's another thing to like to make a non-fictional soap opera. These things, these two things are different. Um, right now I'm studying my Spanish, so I'm watching uh, uh, a telenovela called El Señor de los Cielos uh, about narco traficantes and they're all horrible and kill lots of people and, and it's miserable. <laughs> it goes on for like, I don't know, I think a season, they went to season nine or something like that, but it's fiction. It's fiction, and I know it's fiction, but when people start getting involved in light, real life drama as if they actually have abilities to solve these crimes is concerning to me. Um, and, it's, and it takes away from people's understanding of how crime actually works, how profiling actually works, how investigation actually works. And so it, it's sad to me. Um, and of course, I don't like grifters making tons of money off of people who are sucked into this stuff. They're sucked into it. They 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 believe the grifters because grifters, mind you, are very good con artists and salespersons. I suck at all of this. <laughs> I'm not a con artist or a salesperson. I pretty much just say what I think and it doesn't appeal to a lot of people. But if I had just played the game, I have a house in the Bahamas by now, but they're good at playing the game. Now, there's some people who just tell the, a story of a, of a case. They do a lovely job of storytelling and they have a nice persona. I don't object to that. 
and they have a million view viewers because they tell a they tell a story well, but they only tell the story once, so they're telling a story, um, and I, I'm okay with that because they're, they're just good at doing that. But when you have the kind of grifters who just make a lot of money by putting out 50 videos, this is my soapbox banging. You're right. <laughs> okay, that's it for my soapbox night. I don't have any others. That was just it. Ah, that one bugged me. It did. But let's go to Rudy Gwe. Uh, geez, I know I can't pronounce the names. Gwede. Gwede. All right. Because this one, just the story just blows my I think my, I, sorry. <laughs> my, my, oh my god my laptop is falling over I'm, what is going on here okay this is going to be one of those days okay Re rudy do you remember rudy uh and then Mer meredith uh okay let me find let me find rudy where'd he go rudy uh is that him no that's not him i'm sorry sorry a second i'm having my usual problems Where'd he go? He's here. Okay. I want to put, put this picture out there. This is Meredith Kircher, who was brutally murdered in 2007 in Italy. And she was the one that Amanda Knox was accused of being involved in a salatio and, and also good old Rudy. And here's Rudy. Rudy Guede was, uh, this is Rudy. So anyway, look at him waving. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, he got released from prison in 2021. Now, some of you don't know the story, but basically uh, Meredith was brutally raped and murdered in, 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 a, in a house um, that she shared with other people in Italy. And um, uh, Amanda and her boyfriend acted really squirrely, so they were under suspicion. I do have a video on that because while I don't necessarily think Amanda Knox killed Meredith, I think she had some interaction there in the crime. Uh, but eventually what happened was that she and her boyfriend got let go. And Rudy, this guy, Rudy Guede, was convicted of the crime. He got convicted. Now, now check this out. This is, this is where the story just gets crazy. I mean, you just kind of wonder what's wrong with the justice system, A, in Italy? And what's wrong with people like the girl, new girlfriend of Rudy, what's wrong with her brain? And let me let me read this to you. The only man convicted of brutally killing Meredith Kircher in 2007. Now he got convicted and he went on, got all, he was supposed to get 20 years. Well, he didn't get 20 years. He got half of that. He was let out in, um, what was it, uh, 2000, sorry, I forgot when he was let out here, 2000. Hold on, hold on, I gotta find out where he's about. 2021. Do you know how he got out in 2021? Soapbox coming, Benny. Good behavior. <laughs> A man, and there's no question Rudy was involved. His DNA was there. Okay. Rudy unquestionably raped and murdered Meredith Kircher. This is a serial killer. I don't know what he's done, what he got away with before or whether he didn't or whether he would have gone on to something like this. But a person who would do that kind of thing is a serial killer. He gets 20 years, which is wrong to begin with because he wasn't that old. All right. How old was he at the time? I'm, I'm not even sure. Good behavior in prison. I guess he didn't have any women to rape and murder. A lot of serial killers have good behavior in prison. That doesn't mean you should let them out into society. So he gets let out with half the time. Rape, murder, you get 10 years? What the? Hmm. Italy, you need to do something about that because that's a mess. Not saying that we're any better in the U.S. <laughs> I'm just saying that's a mess. All right. So, so, so what he's, oh, so, so what happened was, all right. So Guede's three decade sentence was reduced to 16 years. Oh, 16. I thought it was 20. Misread, maybe? Okay. Reduced to 16 years on appeal. And then he was released by good behavior in 2021. So so it was like here, and then it was here, and then it was there. You know, so craziness. All right. So now he's out. Let's, let's take a look at his happiness. Hello. Hello, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. And he's going to do community service. Do you want to hire him? I don't think I want to. Anyway, what happened? Apparently... 
he got himself a girlfriend. And you have to wonder, what girl marries a guy? I'm sorry, marries, she didn't marry, but she hooked up with him. What girl hooks up with a guy who is convicted, absolutely convicted of rape and murder? What girl does that? Well, I'm going to say stupid girl. And you can call me any name you want. Stupid girl, desperate girl. I don't know what that girl is. But anyway, get this. He's been rearrested for over allegations he beat up a former girlfriend. Rudy Guede, 36. He's only 36 years old. He's out. He raped and murdered a woman. He's out at 36. I mean, 36. He's, he's a baby, in my opinion. He was issued a restraining order by an Italian judge Wednesday for allegedly abusing his 23-year-old ex-girlfriend. Prosecutors had initially requested Guede be placed under house arrest, but the judge ruled that a 1,600-foot restraining order and an electric monitoring de device were sufficient. <laughs> okay, two things proven. Women can be stupid, and I don't feel sorry for you. I don't. If you hook up with a guy who is a rapist and a murderer, and then you make him your boyfriend, I give... No flying, as you know what that means. Because you're stupid. And you deserve everything you get from that moment on. Because you disrespect the murder of Meredith Kircher. She's a victim. You disrespect her by hooking up with this creep. And you're an idiot on top of it. Just a plain, flaming idiot. But then so is the Italian justice system. who let the guy out in 10 years. And now he's been rearrested for, oh, what a surprise. He beat up a woman. Yeah, that was soapbox number two. You're right about that. <laughs> I so try to avoid the soapboxes, but really? Just really? Ah. Well, let's see what um, Michaela has to say. The minimum sentence in, um, I don't know what AIS means, for murders 20 years on average, they spend 13. That's frightening. Oof. Wow. Uh, he will probably repeat. Well, there's there's two different kinds of murderers, Kathy, and I think you point out a good thing. There's there's situational murderers, and those are people who murder under only one condition that I don't know, they got they got in a fight, they they got in a fight with their wife. Um they're they're sometimes the um uh a person who kills their family off in order to have a new life is a one time deal most of the time. Um somebody who kills somebody accidentally in a robbery, a burglary, whatever they weren't, that wasn't their, their entire thing wasn't about murder, but a person who is a serial killer who purposely rapes and murders, that person loves raping and murdering. They like what they do. And if they can get away with it, they will do it again. Now, will he do it again? That's a different question. He might not repeat that exact thing again because he knows he's being looked at. He's being watched. So even serial killers do stop. But that doesn't make him a nice guy. It doesn't mean he's not going to do other miserable things. And then again, if he thinks he can get away with it, he might repeat. And there have been serial killers who have been let out of prison because everybody said, such a nice guy. Um, and they've ended up committing, co committing the same kind of crime. So, but just... Once somebody rapes and murders, I do not understand why they ever see the light of day again. You can be opposed to the death penalty. I get that. But they should never see the light of day again. I, I just, I just, yeah. <laughs> I guess the judge didn't have a daughter. Hi, Sky Ricky. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Once a beater, always. Mm, well, there's, he's like, oh, this is probably true. Emily points out something good. Uh, she likes the bad boy. This is a problem we have with women who marry serial killers in prison and all this kind of crap. The one who married Jordan van der Sloot uh, down in, um, was it Ecuador? Ecuador? Yeah. Um, she already knew what he was. He killed two women. But she still wanted to marry him because, and I point this out quite often, this is how it works. I am a nobody, and I can only get a date with the 
with the with a guy who stocks shelves at the local grocery because I'm not overly attractive. Um, I just don't. Ha I just haven't had much success in dating. So I know I can get a guy that works at the gas station. I'm not putting down people who work at gas stations or or or, 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 or grocery stores because I'm going to get hate stuff now. But in other words, a guy who's just a regular guy, a regular guy who maybe isn't a Prince Charming, who maybe doesn't make a hundred thou a year. And that's not enough for her to feel good about herself. She could have a wonderful life with the guy from the gas station or the, the grocery store. She could. They could make a life together, have a wonderful family, have fun, have cookouts and all that stuff. But it's, that guy is not enough to make her feel good about herself. So she wants to find somebody notorious. And that notorious guy hooks up with her and she feels like somebody, even if, even if, even if a, a serial killer is somebody. But you wonder, what? why would you think that makes you somebody? But you're talking about somebody with some serious emotional issues. So just, just, oof. Yeah. Um. <laughs> My wife has punished me more than that for not vacuuming regularly. <laughs> oh, I'll take you, Benny, because <laughs> I don't vacuum ever, ever. That's why I hurt people because... I suck at that. I hate the sound of the vacuum. It's loud and noisy, and I don't do it well. Um, uh, let's see what else you have. Yes, this is true, Sarah. Correct, Sarah. Self-esteem issues, absolutely. <laughs> oh, Michaela, you're so mean. The Patreon fees <laughs> help pay Pat's house cleaner. Oh, heck yes, because I would not be doing this show if I had to clean my house. Because I have zero skills, zero skills. And I only have them come in twice a month. But when they come in, I like breathe a sigh of relief so I can continue with my work. Absolutely. <laughs> so mean. I tell you. Okay, I'm going to get on my next next topic. Okay. I want to talk about the L.A. shootings. I think this is really an interesting story. Uh, this guy, there were four people that were murdered in Los Angeles. Uh, by a serial killer. And this guy, it's, is it this guy? Yeah, this guy. All right. His name is J Jared Joseph Powell, man in custody for fatally shooting four men in four days across uh, Los Angeles County. All right. One of the reasons I find this story interesting is, hold on a second, I'm trying to find the in information on it. Seriously? Okay. Hold on. Somewhere here. Oh, there we go. I wish you could see what I have to deal with. Uh, people go, why can't you find anything? Because it's not easy. All right. Suspected serial killer arrested for murdering three homeless men in Los Angeles during a four-day killing spree. So what he did was, there's two reasons I find this fascinating. One is that he, this guy went around, he shot homeless men. And generally speaking, when people do this, usually they don't have a vehicle, but he actually did have a vehicle, which was interesting because he actually span quite a distance with these homeless dudes, which is unusual because, again, usually people are just sort of in the neighborhood and go, oh, look, this will be fun. Usually it's a cheap thrill kill. Um, sleeping homeless people, easy target. Um, it's not necessarily, people think it might be anti-homeless people. Nah, this dude was not anti-homeless people. He didn't give a crap about any of any politics or homeless. Yeah, this guy was a longtime felon. He just thought it was fun. And it's an easy target. So it wasn't a political message or anything like that. He killed these three people that were homeless because they were asleep and easy to shoot. All right. So it says a suspected serial killer believed to be responsible was identified. All right. He's 33 years old. He allegedly shot the three vulnerable men as they slept. Uh, and then a fourth man. This is where it gets also interesting. A fourth man who was not homeless in a botched burglary. This is not a good, who wrote this crap? New York Post. Do you know that a burglary and a robbery are two entirely different things? But anyway, they're claiming it's a botched burglary. First of all, why is it botched? Because the guy ended up dead does not mean it was a botched anything. It means that oftentimes the person just didn't care if they killed the guy. Um, sometimes there is such a thing as a botched robbery. Like the guy's like trying to get the person to give them their money on the street, they're pointing a gun and the guy's like, I don't want to give it to you. And he's fighting him. And, 
theoretically a botched robbery, if you want to call it that. Listen to what happened here. So this guy was arrested for a burglary gone wrong. Well, first of all, if the guy's dead, no one knows whether it went wrong or the guy just did what he wanted to do. Since he already shot three people, I'm going to say he likes shooting people. And it wasn't anything gone wrong. So let's ex explain what happened here. Anyway, the guys, the guy, they did not elaborate on his criminal history. <laughs> well, but he's a convicted felon with a background that includes violent crime. He had a rap sheet like this long. All right. Based on his criminal history, he didn't just start doing this a week ago. No, he had a massive criminal history. The accused murderer began the deranged spree. Uh, mind you, New York Post likes to put in um, all kinds of purple prose and fancy words. Yeah. The deranged spree by allegedly killing 37-year-old Jose Bolanos on Sunday. Ah, uh, crap. Sorry. <laughs> it just rebooted. Seriously? Thank you, New York Post. Some websites do not hold well. All right. So let me let it reboot. All right. Um, so hold on. Hold on a second. All right. And then he, he, he killed three people in a row. And then this is where it got. Cons well, some people say, well, just be, you know, killing homeless people is just as bad as killing n people who are not homeless. But I want to point this out. A lot of times people are like, oh, he's just killing homeless people. Therefore, I'm not worried. But I'll tell you something. It's the same thing we hear when somebody says, oh, he's just killing prostitutes so we don't have to worry. Now, putting aside the fact that somebody's kind of like saying it doesn't matter if they killed homeless people and prostitutes, what they also don't seem to get is that sometimes this is practice for then killing people who are not homeless and not prostitutes. So we have seen cases where a guy will start with prostitutes and then he'll go to the 16 year old girl walking home from school. And in this case, he killed three homeless people who were asleep. But then what did he do? A guy named Nicholas Symbolin. Um, uh, he was a 42 year old father of two. He followed him home. This guy was an electric vehicle charging station to charge his house, the home, before allegedly shooting and robbing him as he got out of the car. It's not a burglary. <laughs> a burglary happens inside a building. Robbery happens when you're on the street. You hold a gun and say, give me your crap. <laughs> That's why I say burglary is crazy. So he got out of the car and he's like, give me your whatever. The suspected serial killer was linked. Oh, so he kills him. This is where the botched robbery slash burglary comes in. We don't even know if he was, what he is, his whole purpose was when he followed this guy to his house, waited for him to get out of the car, and then pointed a gun at him. Was he really trying to rob him? We don't know. Did he want to just kill him because now he's moved on? Did he want to do both? We do not know. But so what happened was, so the first thing I want you to understand is that Serial, serial killers, this kind of guy, um, you never know what he's going to do next. And, and so people who play off, oh, he shot just homeless people sleeping. You may be the next victim and you're not homeless or sleeping. Okay. But now here's the other interesting thing about this. And this is just really fascinating. Um, these are ALPR cameras, which I didn't freaking even know existed. So I have something to learn every day. What happened was, he was linked to various murders by his car, which was spotted at the scene of every homicide. How cool is that? So what happened was they have a thing that's called an automatic license plate reader. It's a system I did not know existed. And what happens is apparently they're all over the place and they're on police cars and they're on the streets and they read every license plate that goes by. Now, generally speaking, nothing's done with this because what's nothing needs to be done with it. But when they get suspicious, they can go through into the system and it can identify if one certain license plate was at four different homicides. And that's what happened in this case. So they the automatic license plate reader tracked Powell down and he was taken into custody. So it saw his his license plate at one location and was able to link him to the other three locations. Unbelievable. So. This is why 
you know, using a car can actually get you caught, which is fascinating. So cover your license plate. No, I didn't say that, did I? Although there was a really cool video the other day. It was, I don't know where it was on, probably TikTok. But anyway, these guys were like, um, they're outside of a store and they were like putting tons of stuff that they'd shoplifted into the vehicle. And they had like, like tinfoil over the license plate. And the guy was like, hey, dudes, what are you doing? And he's like filming them. But he, but the license plate is covered. And as they were going to leave, he ran up and pulled the light, the tin foil away. So the license plate was exposed. I thought that was pretty cool. So I guess they got caught. But this is an interesting situation where it says here, uh, they, when they finally did stop him, a uh, handgun was found inside the vehicle, possibly identified as the, the murder weapon in all four murders. Had they not had access to the tools, which is the, this interesting new system of identifying cars by license plate, he would still be moving around the city in the region and killing individuals, innocent individuals. Um, so there's a lot of people who think this is a violation of certain rights that as we, we move around as, as citizens of a country to be constantly watched every moment that... In other words, the government can tell where, where all the your car has been going, like... You, you went to the meeting on <laughs> something the government doesn't like. So people are concerned about that. And I'm going to stop that right here. Please do not write any political comments. This is not a political channel. I'm just pointing out that some people are concerned about that, but it does do wonders for, for uh, law enforcement. And uh, generally speaking, you're not going to be noted for driving around in different places if you're going to if you're getting away from the governmental issues. Uh, if you're not committing crimes, nobody cares about you. It's like people say, oh, my God, somebody could be listening in on my telephone. I'm like, you know how boring you are? <laughs> I mean, half the time we don't even want to hear what our relatives and friends have to say. Much less some poor schmuck in the government going, oh, my God, she's going to talk about her dog again. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so it's boring. So unless there's something absolutely outrageous, most of the time people... Nobody cares about you. That's just like, you, I'll make you feel comfortable. Nobody cares about you. I mean, I've been out here for many years and people have said, oh my God, maybe maybe these people don't like you and these people don't like you. I'm like, look, I've been out here for 30 years doing stuff. The government has not come after me yet because I'm not a subversive person. I'm not doing anything. I'm not working on, I'm not making bombs in the house, but again, not a political channel. So I'm just saying this is a law enforcement tool and it's a very useful law enforcement tool. But if you have a concern about the camera issue, take it someplace else. So, but I think that's fascinating um, because I didn't actually know that existed. I did not know that the license plate thing existed. So, you know, that was just amazing. Um, uh, Sarah points out a good point, victim of opportunity, not homelessness. Yes. Uh, this is one of the reasons prostitutes also get um, targeted is because there's, oh, hold on, they're knocking people at my door. Hold on, hello, who is it? I'm doing my show. You want to come back in an hour? <laughs> okay. <laughs> my granddaughter. <laughs> Every once in a while, she shows up during a show. So she's coming back in an hour. Uh, yeah, but a victim of opportunity, not homelessness. Uh, prostitutes also are very easy targets. Home uh, drug users are easy targets. Um, hitchhikers are easy targets. A lot of times, the the serial killer um, doesn't really care who you are. It's just how easy it is to take you out and to get their throw. So a lot of times, it's not a again a, a personal or political thing. It's not a big issue there. So. <laughs> You say you're not subversive, but how do we know? You don't. Mm, you do not. You do not. <laughs> oh, but Pat made a new friend. She can be part. I'm trying to figure out who I made a new friend. Okay, so some of you are saying she can be part of the show. Who? Who, who is going to be part of the show? Uh oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, when you have so many comments come in. Uh, uh, <laughs> I often have no clue who's saying what and why. Uh, I'm going back. I can't, I can't figure it out. Okay. I don't know what the joke was. I missed it. All right. Let me go to the next one. Um, speaking of persons, I, I want to 
talk about the difference between psychopathy. This guy is, in my opinion, a psychopath. He knew exactly what he was doing. He wasn't having any issues. He was doing what he's doing because it was a big fat thrill. He's a long-term felon. And, and who knows whether it was a botch robbery or just a robbery or just a robbery. And he likes to shoot people. I do not know. But there was this guy, this guy, his name is James Yu. And he's, he lives in Arlington, Virginia, which is like a 30 minute drive from where I'm at. And the police went out to his house and it blew the heck up. Like you would not believe. Um, just look, look at this. See this. The house he's in is actually behind the house that you can still see standing. Is that one huge fireball or is that a fireball? Now, his the question here is, who is this James U guy? A link to Arlington House explosion. All right. So this is a, this is what this is where you find a person who the difference between psychopathy and you have some psych um, some level of schizophrenia. Um, you have some level of delusions. Uh, some people would just say you're Looney Tunes. Okay, you can do whatever you want with any of these things. And of course, I'll get hate mail for saying Looney Tunes. But listen to what this guy says. A Virginia man with a history of rambling social media posts and frivolous lawsuits has been linked to an Arlington house that exploded Monday night after police arrived to investigate claims someone was inside shooting flares into the neighborhood. His name, he was 56 years old, lived in a duplex house, which concerns me because I don't know who lived in the other half of the duplex house. Hopefully they weren't home. Uh, show, it was shown exploding. Uh, they confirmed his identity and his remains, human remains have been recovered from the site. They believe it's you, but they don't know. Not you, but Y-O-O, -O, you. <laughs> uh, although his LinkedIn profile appears to have been disabled, you preserve some of his posts on a YouTube page along with silent videos showing court filings from some of his failed lawsuits. Two of the videos showed his recent LinkedIn posts appeared to have been removed. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see. The posts refer to his ex-wife as a witch and anti-U.S. slogans including F America and, and quotes from Noam Chomsky. Um, the profile description claims he is a former head of information and physical security for an international telecommunications company. I give them, y'all, every opportunity to do the right thing. And all I see is America's hypocrisy, corruption, fraud, conspiracy. All right. Um, but then he says this. Um, he covered all his, this is where, this is where, you know, regardless of, I don't know what his political viewpoints are and it doesn't matter. He covered his windows in aluminum foil. <laughs> when people start covering their heads in aluminum foil, their televisions and their windows, usually this means they're suffering from some level of schizophrenia or delusions of some sort, some psychosis. In one of his most recent po posts, he posted a rant about his neighbor's activity. This is how white people operate and have the luxury of outnumbering all other races by seven to one in America. In other posts, he claimed that he's being targeted by hateful messaging and made references to assassination. He tried to sue his ex-wife, the state of New York, and more than a dozen others, depriving him of civil rights and charges, <laughs> string of similar complaints, all kinds of crap. Um, he was paranoid. He was paranoid. Doesn't matter. He thought his, uh, he thought the people, this, the, the neighbors were spying on him. Um, and a lot of times, I want you to understand this about psychosis and paranoia. What they come up with as the reasons are meaningless. It, you know, what, what, sometimes they'll go this political way. Sometimes they'll go this political way. Sometimes they'll blame these people. And sometimes they'll blame these people. None of it matters. It's psychosis. And sometimes they will run, go into a uh, whatever is popular that they've run into that can bolster what they think. This is psychosis. Uh, this is this is somebody who's got a severe me uh, a mental problem. This is not psychopathy. This is not a psych psychopaths know exactly what they're doing. They're not delusional. This guy is totally delusional. <laughs> Why he was doing he was sending out these flares. I don't know. He's trying to attack his neighbors. I don't know what he think he thought he was doing. Uh, I would be interested to see when he went off the rails. I mean, there's something clearly he's lost it. Um, that's a person who truly is in psychosis. Uh, I want to understand that. And it's not all people who have schizophrenia are not necessarily like this. Okay. This is a, this is a more rare instance of uh, when a person becomes very delusional, but the, when people start wanting to put tinfoil on their heads in the windows, 
they kind of know they've lost it when they think people are spying on them through their TV sets and every neighbor is after them. It doesn't matter what political thing they add to it, or what their belief system is. None of that matters. They've simply become paranoid and they'll use one, one theory or the other to support paranoia. Um, it's a sad situation. I don't know what happened to the guy. I don't know why he became paranoid. I don't know if he was ever like it, 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 Claims he makes about his employment in the past. I don't know if it's true or whether he made that up too. I don't know. I don't know who this guy was in the past, but uh, apparently somewhere along the way, he's gone. He went off the edge. So that that's the difference. I just wanted to point out that the guy in California was killing people for fun. That's a psychopath. This guy is delusional. So, um, and it does, you know, a lot of times I talk about psychopathy way more than rarely do I say, oh, that person's delusional. Uh, but there are points when a person is clearly they are not in control of their senses. There's something is going on in their brain that is um, creating stuff that's just not true. And it's, and they're not faking it. Like sometimes a, a psychopath will, will claim that after the fact. They're like, he'll run around nude in the, and say, people are out to get me. People are out to get me. I'm like, yeah, you're just faking that because you know you already got caught for, for your whatever you've been doing, like serial homicide, or you killed your wife and children. So now you you try to claim you're delusional. That, that's just fake. But this guy, I'm going to say, he's delusional. Um, the strange, what is the Madison case? <laughs> well, we, we try to do that over in in the uh, patron chats where you can talk there, but this is, I try to keep people on task. Like if I'm going to do a show, I don't want to go back to other things that I'm not talking about. So otherwise we, we just go completely away from what the show is about. So, um, oh yes, uh, this is true, Alyssa. Uh, I think Lori Vallow is completely sane. Absolutely. She was a psychopath and a con artist. Absolutely. Um, so, and, and but she, some people thought because she had um, some issue about um, that she she was hooking up with a guy who's doing this sort of religious stuff that means she's delusional. No, it does not. A lot of delusional people are simply con artists, and a lot of people get involved in these things can be con artists too. So it has nothing to do with some people who. Are very religious are not conners. They, they truly believe what they believe and they want to share it with people. So, but you got to look at what they're doing in their lives. What kind of, if they're doing scary stuff or something. So, um, let's see. Um, what? <laughs> It's very fast. Am I being fast and random? <laughs> or is that something else? I have. Sometimes I don't know what people are talking about. All right. I want to talk about... Um, Benny brought this up. And I want to bring this along with um, the question of the, the... We have the serial killer out in Los Angeles. And Benny was talk, brought to me two different cases. And these are all... These are in the UK... Um, this is a woman who, let's see if I can find it. Um, hold on a second. Okay. This is the first woman. Um, she was, because they have more, we have more uh, gun things and they, and in the, in the UK, there's more knife killings uh, because guns are not so pre prevalent in the UK. Um, in this particular case, um, this woman was stabbed to death. She was just dropping off her children she gets stabbed by this guy. We don't know who this, why this guy did this. Okay, I'm trying to find this. Okay, um, her name. Her name. She was pregnant. She's 29 years old and pregnant. This guy on the bottom, and they they caught him. Uh, went and stabbed her. He was like stalking her and stabbed her. Um, and in the beginning, a lot of people thought, oh, this is like some kind of uh, like uh, maybe a terrorist attack or whatever. But you have to be careful when these things happen because. We don't know in the early times whether we're, this is a, one of the one of the um, one of the media outlets said it was a domestic, but I don't know. They didn't support that as being a domestic like this guy knew her, or this you know for some reason. Um, so 
is it a random attack that we have to worry about as we walk down the street, somebody's going to attack us, or is there something else that's more connected? And the information isn't out yet. The woman has survived. The baby has survived. It's all good as far as that goes. This guy's been caught, but we don't have information. So sometimes what happens is we jump to conclusions. And so here's another, another interesting uh, story. This is, um, this happened, a gang attacked. This man had been going, he'd gone off to um, KFC with his son to buy some chicken. Okay. And when, when that, when he went to do that, um, this, this is, this is the father, Kel, uh, Kelvin Ward, and he drives away and he's hit by another vehicle. Um, let's see if I have a picture of that. No. Uh, and then these guys, after they hit his vehicle, you can see they're, they're, they're out there with, um, uh, they call them a zombie knives, um, machetes, uh, cutlass. I don't know, depending on where you're from is what you might call that. But it's a whole gang, uh, and they're they're covered. There's four of these guys, and they get they do get caught. And these are the four guys. Now, what's interesting? Horrifying crime. I mean, these guys just—it's it, horrifying because it's all on video. You can you can go and see it on video. And the question is, why uh, are these? Is this um, just a random attack on the street? This guy goes and buys KFC, and all of a sudden, this car just hits him and. They come out with the with the zombie knives and try and they kill the man. They kill the man. Why? Well, it turns out his son was friends with the guys in this gang, um, and so it wasn't a random attack. Not a good. I'm not saying it's right, but it wasn't random. What we do have is a violent gangs. Uh, somebody said that they knew these kids when they were younger and they were crap then, so they've been growing up doing stuff and they had already they card they did a carjacking as well carjacking and then went after this kid apparently they attacked the house a few days prior and so i don't know what was going on with this kid and this gang but supposedly he was trying to distance himself from the gang supposedly because he didn't like what they were doing so on one hand you say well that's good for the kid he's like you know he's like seven, i think it was like 17 he's like oh i'm gonna step away these guys aren't you know i don't want to be part of this but you wonder what part he, part he was of it prior to that moment, because these guys had a long history of being scumbags. Why was he hooked up with them? And why did they feel a need to kill him after he walked away? I don't know the answers to this. I know is that when the father, when they went after his son, the father intervened trying to save his son, which he did. The father got killed. Father supposedly also knew who these guys were and he was trying to encourage them because supposedly he had a little bit of a rough early, we don't get the information on that, a rough earlier time and to straighten himself out the father. And he was saying to these young men, I'll help you get jobs so you don't have to go around doing stupid stuff. He was trying to help them. So we have a, we have an interesting story that we don't know exactly why things go down the way they did. Um, we do know we have a problem with gangs. We know we have a problem with uh, violence. Um, and we have in Bowie, Maryland, where I live, there was an interesting story that just came out um, that my town is considered the safest town in all of Maryland. So safe that people leave their doors open, unlocked. <laughs> so a lot of people in Bowie who are now really pissed. Thanks for telling people that. But we've had a spate of carjackings in our town, which we've never had before. Now, I'm not saying they're committed by the people who lived in our town, but people are coming into the town. Uh, and is it as safe as people say? No, we're, we're frightened of carjackings now. In a town that has never had this, this was considered the richest African-American town in the United States. People that live here live in very fancy houses. They have great jobs. The kids go to private school. Uh, you know, this is a very um, well-to-do town. Um, and suddenly we have a spate of carjackings. We've had like, I forgot, eight in the last like month or two. Craziness. People are getting frightened. So we have this across the world. We have problems with youth getting involved in, in these kind of gang things. Carjackings are out of control, obviously in England as well as in the United States. And people using, in the U.S., people are getting shot. The juveniles are shooting people with guns. And in the U.K., they're using knives. And... Um, 
Well, we have we have people, you know, it, it, it's out of control. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it, um, what the schools are going to do about it, because a lot of the violence is in schools as well or outside of schools. On the way home from schools, we having we're having major issues of youth out of control, angry. And violent. And uh, what are we going to do about it? And I, I'm not getting on that soapbox because I actually do not know. But I thought it was interesting that Benny brought this forth that um, th things happening um, in, in every part of the world right now with the, with the youth. And it's, it's frightening. Um, oh, really? That's interesting. Nina says crime is up everywhere. My sleepy town has had a spate of break ins, too. Very, very sad. Um, Uh, let's see. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it was in England, not in Kentucky, the U.S. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, this is normally true, Sarah, that crime goes down in the winter, especially like in the United States. One of the lowest crime days is um, uh, Super Bowl, because even the criminals like to watch football. <laughs> but yes, it usually goes down. But and some people will say that, and again, I don't want to get political. Some people will say it's climate change because it's warmer in Maryland has ever been. So we have more people out there going, hey, it's not cold. So <laughs> that could be a problem. But I think we have a, a lot of um very unhinged, depressed uh youth at the moment, which is it's just frightening to me. Um, really frightening. So you have that too. See. That's it's Kurtz, uh, Broughton says this in Germany. We have a lot of preteens killing each other. It's it's an odd thing. I mean, uh, stuff that generally speaking, we hadn't heard of ever before. I, I know that in my area, there was a juvenile one of those um, where, where the kids, the bad kids in school were sent to the juvenile school, you know, juvenile detention school. And it used to be that these were the rare few and they would move them out because they were like dangerous to other children. So they wouldn't have them there. And I remember one time my mind, my niece came and she came to live with us and I took her to the local high school. Um, and, and the high school was Parkdale in Maryland. And um, somebody had spray painted on the parking lot Packdale because I left the R out, which gives you a clue of how good that school was. And she looked at it and she was coming out of Washington DC from a neighborhood that was kind of rough. And I was trying to give her a better life. And she looks at me and goes, looks the same here to me. And I was like, oh, my God, it does. <laughs> and luckily, I was homeschooling my kids. And that would have been the school. My kids would have gone to high school. And we went to a, a basketball game there once to, be, to watch it. And my son turned to me. One of my sons turned to me and said, thank you, Ma, for not having us go here. So, uh, but that's, you know, but that was even, this was back in the 80s. I'm sorry, 90s. 90s and this was starting to go that direction but now it's gotten really really bad and i just don't know what's going on i really don't i think we're gonna have to see somebody try to try to figure out oh my gosh my town is hi melrose my town is the murder capital of canada where do you live <laughs> well yeah we're all like what town so we don't move there uh let's see uh, what town is uh what town is that are we in toronto or someplace else Oh, this Clarissa says in Houston, crime is happening in very affluent neighborhoods now. Doesn't matter where you live. Yeah, and, and we have also people when they're carjacking, they can take the cars to the location that they want to then uh, commit more crimes. Um, so we have that going on. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just frightening. It it's just a very frightening thing. Let's see. I want to talk about just because I'm going to talk about this in. Uh, the issue of Shanna and she she and her new husband supposedly accused of killing her ex-husband and the two of them together in a, a folie a deux. And I've done uh, two shows which I talked about folie a deux. Uh, the most recent one was Jens, um, um, what's his face? Um, <laughs> oh, that's his name. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> Why can't I remember anything? Um, let me go look at my picture and see, where is it? Uh, Jens Gore, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, it's uh, Jens Soaring. I almost said Goring. <laughs> he was a Nazi. Uh, Jens Soaring and, um, and his girlfriend, um, which is Elizabeth Hansen. Have I got that right at least? Hope I got that right. Um, Hansen, uh, the two of them 
uh, ended up, her parents ended up brutally murdered. And he is, both of them went to prison and it was considered a folie a deux, which is insanity between two people. That, that these two people, if they hadn't gotten together, wouldn't have caused committed such horrific crimes. Sometimes people uh, think of those as also um, serial killer duos. I don't consider that the same thing. Uh, there is always a stronger and a weaker person in any any couple, any, any partnership. That's always true. There's a leader and a follower. That's true. Because you, two leaders don't get along, you know? So there's always a leader and a follower. But does one if they hadn't gotten together, would both of those people never have committed the crime? And I don't think that's true. I just think when they got together, they just got together. Um, now, sometimes there's circumstantial crimes that happen. In the case of Jens Suring and, and his girlfriend, Elizabeth, perhaps neither one of them would have been involved in the murder of her parents had not they felt or she felt and then he felt that the parents were problem in their lives. Um, yes, they may not have committed the crime. It doesn't mean they don't have major issues. I think Jens Soaring represents psychopathy pretty well. I don't know what else he would have done if he hadn't done what he was convicted of, which was killing her parents. I don't know what she would have done if he hadn't come along to be helpful. Would she have inspired him to kill her parents or committed the crime with him, depending on how you want to look at it. Check out my video on that. Um, it's true that sometimes circumstances push us over the edge, but doesn't make us different people just because of, you know, we wouldn't, there's certain things we would never do if we would never do them. And there's things that we would do if we only had an opportunity or push to do them. So, so when we come down to Shanna and Kill, uh, the the death of her murder not death murder of her ex husband that was a, supposedly a hit which looks pretty much like what it was that she and her husband of the time hired somebody to kill off the ex husband so because of the custody battle of the children if she hadn't hooked up with the new husband would this have happened I can't answer that but does it do, is that an excuse for committing a crime. Oh, well, I was only suckered into it by a folie a deux. Is that what the problem is? So I was asked to look at the, the, the case of the, the, the French nanny who was murdered. Um, let's see if I can find her. Um, because this, it looks like a folie a deux thing again. Uh, where is she? Hmm. Hold on a second. Uh, oh, here she is. So here's the French nanny. Uh, her name is Sophie Lyonnais. At least that's the way I would pronounce it. French au pair Sophie Lyonnais. So she's hired to, um, to take care of these two children of the guy on the left. Is, his name is, and I, I, I cannot pronounce this properly, Osim Medoni and his wife, Sabrina and I can't, her name is really weird, like who did I don't know. Anyway, I'm just going to call them Sam and Sabrina because I can't pronounce their names properly. So, um, so apparently, let me tell you a little bit about these two. So this is a La Folie a Deux situation where they, most people feel sorry for the guy and not her. They think she was the one that pushed him into everything because she was, she appeared to be very delusional and not just psychopathic, but extremely delusional. And the question is, yeah, it's, it's real. I haven't really gone deep into the psychology, but let me, let me tell you a little bit about this case. Um, and this is from the Washington post. Um, so they were, they basically, they tortured this poor, poor girl. And then, and then, made a bonfire in the backyard and killed, finished, well, getting rid of the body, shall we say. And apparently there was clothing, jewelry, a human nose and fingers. So it wasn't like, they tried to claim it was a lamb. <laughs> well, it was a sacrificial one, but it was a, it was a human. Um, uh, both of the, the, both the, the, the homeowner, which was uh, Sam, uh, he's um, from, uh, he was a French Algerian. 
financial analyst. So this is a guy who's well-educated. I want to put that forth right there. Well-educated human being. All right. So the story goes like this. And they say this. The judge actually said the folio de in, in noting this, what the crime was. And he says it's a remarkably rare instance of folio de or dual psychosis. Can you cause another person to have psychosis? Can you? And that's an interesting uh, issue because we often hear about when we have like a, almost a group psychosis where uh, there was a whole thing on what TikTok where everybody was starting to have um, ticks and we're ticks on TikTok and all these teenagers suddenly could speak right and were swearing and doing all kinds of, you know, things that were very rare and was uh, a, a syndrome that they shouldn't be having, but they're all on TikTok doing this stuff. So that was like a group psychosis or was it attention seeking? What, so the question is, does the brain, and I, I can't really, I can't prove all of this stuff in, the, in this little thing. I'm just going to point it out. We have, is our brain doing something to the point where we believe things truly that aren't true? Or are we happy to go along with something that's a fantasy? And that's the question. And this where, that's where the legal end is legally. When you commit a homicide, you're put away because you knew you were doing wrong. But if you have delusions, the question is, do you know you're doing wrong? Do you think something is true that isn't true? And that gets to be this. So anyway, for, for, for Leo Du, the judge noted that um, she was diagnosed with depression and borderline personality disorder. Okay, so now... Is that psychosis? Because depression isn't psychosis. Borderline personality disorder isn't necessarily psychosis. And psychopathy, which she may well have had is or exhibited, was is also not necessarily psychosis. Psychosis is where you cannot tell reality from unreality. But anyway, it said that she had affected her lover with her own unhinged delusions. And you have to wonder here, when you're talking about fol fol folia de, at what point when a person starts ex telling you stuff that's ludicrous, do you say, my girlfriend's nuts, and you walk away? But if you're willing to go along with it, why is that? Why are you going along with stuff that in the beginning you have to, you can't like get psychosis in a second. So if she says something really crazy, crazy. You should be saying, whoo, I don't want anything to do with that. But why are you willing to stay around? Is it because you believe it? Well, probably not. So at what point do you become deluded as well? See, this is this this is where the court system has to struggle with this. Um, and does it is it even true? The testimony presented at trial showed the couple submitted the young au pair to starvation and brutal torture until she admitted her part in a fantasy that had twisted both um, Sam's and what what's her name again? Sabrina. Sam, I've got to find her name again because I want to use the easier version. Okay, what is it? Uh, hold on a second. Sabrina. Okay, Sam, Sam, and some people say Sam. I'll say Sam. Sam and Sabrina. Um, uh, they they tortured her to death. Um, she was, they had been together for a long, long time. She was a glamorous, would-be fashion designer. Look at her. Look at, okay, look at this couple. This does not look like a weirdo delusional couple that's like like living under a bridge. She she was super, super, she was quite famous, actually. And she had hooked up with Mark Walton, founding member of Boyzone. And she hooked up with him after she was already in a relationship with him. So she left him and hooked up with him for a year. And he said he was madly in love with her. And then she lost her mind on that and then went back to him. Okay. Very strange. Let me try to explain to you how this sort of worked. Um, he was 35. They had, okay, they met, they were both born in Algeria, but were raised in Paris. Uh, Sabrina was 18 and worked at a sweet stall. Uh, when she was spotted by uh, Sam, the older man pursued the younger girl. They make a big deal of it. They're five years apart. <laughs> I thought that was like 20 years apart. No, it's five. Okay, so she's 18, he's 23. The older man, get out of here. <laughs> this is some stupid writing. Anyway, 
Um, and they pursued the young girl, the perfectly of adult girl, uh, who was only five years younger, and they fell into a relationship. Uh, she left when uh, she left for London to work as a nanny. So, so Sabrina went to London to work as a nanny. He came along, eventually earning a degree in economics and taking a job with a French bank. Okay, he's doing well, and she's she's got a job as a nanny. Although the couple was joined by a traditional a Muslim marriage certificate, so they keep saying they were like in a relationship, lovers. Where I'm sorry, but if they have a certificate, they're married people. This is husband and wife. I don't understand what they mean by a traditional Muslim marriage certificate. It's a marriage. Um, she openly flouted the relationship, referring to him as a relative or friend publicly while dating other men. <laughs> okay, this would be a big hint for him to run away. You know, if you're actually married to the woman, you went through an entire ceremony, a Muslim ceremony to be married, and your wife is out there cheating on you? I don't know what's wrong with this guy. Is that what you call... Uh, being completely obsessed with somebody to the point where you're just a com complete cock. I mean, I don't know what, what is wrong with you. So they, the prosecutors presented him as being weak and pliable, open to suggestion. Well, he had a lot of time to weak and pliable. Where is your responsibility when you, when a person, I don't care if you have the, like, you're really attracted to them. At what point do you realize that this person is not worth being with? And where is your responsibility? You, you know, this thing where, oh, I, I couldn't help myself. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Especially when it comes into homicide. So anyway, then um, Sabrina in 2011 met Mark Walton at a Notting Hill bank, the Irish-born founder of the 1990s boy group Boyzone. Walton had gone on to major success in the music industry, and they began a romantic relationship. I was in love, Walton told the court. She was my life then. Of course, you were dating a married woman, unless she lied to you about it. They moved in together, and Walton financially supported Sabrina as she tried to break into the fashion industry. As he told the court, he sometimes saw her unhinged side. She would go from softly spoken French accent. She would flip and get very angry and loud and not care where we were. According to the Times, in 2012, Sabrina began making wild claims to the police about Walton. He, she reported he was sleeping with male prostitutes, and then he discovered that she had hidden cameras in the couple's flat. <laughs> this was in 2012, beginning, I don't know. In 2014, they split. Her bizarre reports to the police continued even after she returned to her husband. Okay, so that dude, uh, the... the, the um, uh, the uh, Walton dude, he needed to get the heck away from that woman because she, she's a crazy woman, right? And she's reporting stuff to the police. Now, why was she doing this? Did she believe this stuff or was she one of these false reporters who liked causing trouble, getting attention? And I don't know because I haven't been able to diagnose anything and I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I haven't been able to look at this. She eventually accused Walton of sexually abusing a cat. <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, can, she comes up with some stuff. Hiring helicopters to spy on her and even targeting her with black magic. Um, at this point, the people with a white coat should have taken her away to a mental institution. I don't know how, if she's reporting this kind of crap and false reporting to the police, that she is not at some point held accountable and put in a mental institution or something else is done to her. She was cautioned. Oh, she also said he was a pedophile. Um, she was cautioned by police to stay away from Walton. Oh, goody. For, for five years, her obsession continued, even while moving into the Wimbledon Park house with her, her husband. Um, so she was still obsessed. People said she was still obsessed with him. And she would show photos on her phone and say he was a dangerous person. And then they get this poor nanny came in. 15 months before her death, Sophie Leone had come to work with them. A shy 21-year-old with pale green eyes, she had hoped the time in London would help, help her with the English. But the circumstances on Wilbledon Park Road were dark. Leone was forced to sleep in a bunk bed in a room with a couple's two children. Eh, it's not that dark, but okay. <laughs> um, but she was regularly denied food and rarely left the house. Okay. I feel sorry for people who don't realize that when they're being abused, they need to run away. 
really quickly. If she was actually being denied food, she needed to get out of the house immediately. She said rarely left the house, means she did leave the house. One time when she left the house, she should have run. It's just so sad. Um, her body language shows something was wrong. Once she said Sabrina beat her, I asked why, and she said she had dropped the butter. Okay, she's in a restaurant. She's just said that she has been beaten. Go to the place and don't go back. Oh, poor girl. I just can't believe that she went back. Anyway, eventually Sabrina fixed the au pair into her delusions involving Walton. So now they said the last six weeks of Lanny's life, the couple had become convinced, or did they, that Walton had seduced Leone and in return, the au pair was drugging Sam so that Walton could sneak into the house and sexually abuse the man, <laughs> him, the guy. So, so they began starving her and subjecting her to brutal interrogation se sessions, beating and stunking her head into underwater until she agreed she was in league with Walton, uh, according to testimony. And they actually, they actually, um, they recorded the sessions on their cell phones. So, and then they killed her. They, they fractured her ribs. They drowned her. It was horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Uh, now Sabrina, they blame. Okay. And this is what interests when they get to court, uh, Sam and Sabrina blamed each other for taking her life. Now you see, this is where their delusions are no longer together. Why is that? If they both believe in the same thing, why do they not still believe the same thing happened? Uh, Sam for, uh, Sabrina said that some forced her to have sex near the au pair's dead body after the murder. Both, though, did admit to plotting to get rid of the remains in a bonfire, and they cooked chicken out back in order to cover up the burning body. Oh, lovely. All right. Um, we're, we're at you know, it just, it just, it just boggles my mind. It's like nobody took responsibility for anything for themselves, for other people, the justice system, all of that failed. And is this fully a do? Is anybody more responsible than the other? And is it, is it an excuse because you're obsessed with somebody to create these stories or is, are you truly delusional? And her, is Sam knowing that she's a nutcase and cheated on him and did all these other things to him, why would he buy into the delusional stuff? Or, or does he just do it because it'll bring her back to him because he wants to be with her and he's willing to do anything for her because he wants to be with her. And is that delusional too? Or, or do we have some responsibility for our own decisions? The crazy that is one of the craziest stories i ever heard just bizarre i haven't looked into it you know in depth but i think it's um but it's a, a fully a claim that this is this is wouldn't have happened if the two of them two of them hadn't been together and i don't think that's true i think if he hadn't been around she would have done the same thing i think he just was some kind of weird sucker who just wanted her so badly he was willing to kill be involved in killing in order to have what he wanted I consider that narcissism, but yeah, it's a, it's a strange one, but you know, we don't have these too often, but we have again, when I do the Sh uh, Shannon case, Shannon case, her new husband, did he help kill her ex-husband because he was delusional <laughs> because his, because his wife made him think that way? Or was it because it was useful to him to get rid of a couple of kids? I mean, to get rid of her ex-husband so she wouldn't whine about it anymore. I don't know. Um. <laughs> well, there's always that. <laughs> that shit, great, great. Yeah, she was, you know, it's weird because she definitely, definitely had a fairly good life. I mean, this, this she had money. She had, she was, she, she hobnobbed with old people in high places, you know, I mean, all, all the entertainers and stuff. She had good things going for her. So what was it about her that turned on the people she was with to do these things? What was it? And was it that she, that she never got enough out of her relationships? This could be a, a 
complete narcissistic thing. I don't get enough out of my relationship with my husband. So I'm going to go off and cheat with you with this, this, uh, this famous guy. And then the famous guy isn't giving her enough either. So she's going to go to the police and accuse him of doing horrific things. And then when that didn't work out, she goes back to the husband and she's still not satisfied because he is what he was when she was first married to him. So now she's going to create another scenario to get herself that kind of attention and, and a demand for uh, um, to show me how much you love me. Will you do this for me? Does she need that kind, that level of uh, people to be, uh, to be obsessed in return that she has to be put on such a pedestal that they literally do anything for her? That's a level of high level of narcissism. I don't know that that's so delusional as, as narcissism. And the question is, was she really delusional or is this narcissistic personality disorder at a high level that she'll claim anything? Because I've been around narcissists who've done exactly that. And I get phone calls from people who make claims. Oh, somebody's following me. Somebody, my ex is doing this. Um, I'm being stalked. Uh, I was, I was kidnapped into a satanic, whatever. And they can never come up with any actual proof of these things. I think they want my attention. I think they want to say these things happen to them because it makes them be important because otherwise they're not important enough. Apparently that seemed to be some of her issues. So is that delusional or is that purposeful? And the problem is it's hard to prove. It really is. But, you know, but you're in the in the long run, unless you really don't have a grasp of reality, unless they can prove that she didn't have, she was totally unaware of reality. And her claims, is that really, I mean, when she claimed like her boyfriend was having sex with a cat, I mean, did she really believe that? Or is she just saying things to, to shock people? And unless you can prove that she really, truly 100% believed that, I think she's 100% responsible for her behaviors. And so is her creepy husband. So, um, Uh, <laughs> well, that could be uh, ego thing. He's a rich career guy who made it in London. Didn't want to admit he had a crazy wife in life. Perhaps. Um, uh, and that's true too. It enabled her. Yes. And it, yeah. Um, well, but that poor girl, the poor girl, uh, unfortunately didn't know that she needed to leave like ASAP. The, the importance of a job, watching a couple kids and learning some English, is nowhere near as important as people beating you to death while you're doing it. I don't know why she stayed. I don't know. It makes me sad to think that she didn't have the wherewithal to to bolt out of there. Because clearly she, she was outside of there. She could have left. And I don't know why she stayed. I, you know, I, 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 it's just really super sad. Super sad for that poor young woman. That's just creepy. Oh, uh, what happened to them? I think they're in prison, as far as I know. The pair will be sentenced on June 26th. When did this? Oh, my God, I got to look back. I'll we'll see when this happened. Um, that was 2018, so they got sentenced. But I, I don't know what their sentence was, to tell you the truth. Um, so I didn't get that far in the uh, story. I was just looking at the issues of what is fully a do, um, which I thought was just, say, super creepy. Um, let's see what time we have here. If I have any time, something left here. Uh, let me see. I want to do something fun. Is there something fun? <laughs> hmm. Um, oh, somebody asked me to do, talk about Frederick Bourdin, Bourdin, the chameleon dude. Um, he's a guy that pretended he was, as a French guy, who pretended he was a teenager when he wasn't. And he pretended he was missing teenagers. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I might do a, a longer thing on this one day, but I just want to point out there was a family. Um, this is this is the guy. Um, it's kind of creepy looking. But anyway, um, that's what is this picture? Oh, yeah, that's him. Now. That's him. Supposedly got married eventually and have five kids. And and they say they don't know quite what happened with him. But anyway, let's go back to this. All right. So here he is. This is this is the guy they call the chameleon. I suppose it was a Netflix show down on it and I couldn't find it, but um, he, um, he became like, he's like the catch me if you can type of thing. He's a con artist who poses as something he's not and gets away with it and gets a tremendous amount of uh, traction 
and and excitement out of what he does. Uh, he was um, he was raised by his grandparents because apparently his mother was like a single mom, got pregnant, was partying, and they got custody of him. Um, he claims that his mother like didn't care about him and that she liked to pretend she was uh, like super sick, so he he'd be terrified. She liked terrifying him. That's his claim. Who knows? Um, but he uh, he went on in his life to impersonate a bunch of missing children. And originally he just pretended he was orphans. He was like an adult person who pretended he was a teenager and then he pretended he was an orphan and then he would end up in schools as this person that he wasn't. And so um, let, me, let me try to give you a little bit of the earlier part of his life. Um, he he um he portrayed so many young children um and he did this for years uh for example um he in 2004 um he was in spain and he claimed to be an adolescent named ruben sanchez espinoza whose mother had been killed in the madrid bomb attacks <laughs> they found out it wasn't him and they deported him to france in 2004 and he was uh, okay wait, in 2003 he claimed he was Leo Bailey, a 14-year-old French boy who had been missing since 1996. DNA proved he wasn't. Uh, 2005, he passed himself off as Francisco Hernandez Fernandez, a 15-year-old Spanish orphan, and spent a month in a uh, junior high school in France. He claimed his parents had been killed in a car accident. He dressed as a teenager, adopted a proper walking style, covered his receding hairline with a baseball cap, and he was stuffed you know, those creams to get rid of the, he didn't want to shave because that would leave like beard. So he's like using those, um, what do you call them? Depilatory creams to get nair, that's what we used to call it, to, to pull out the hairs and look, make you soft, right? On June uh, June 12th, they finally unmasked him out. They saw a, a, a television show about his previous exploits. So he was sentenced to four months in prison. Hold on, I got to sneeze. <laughs> okay, uh, spent four months in prison for possessing and using the false identity. He just got four months, you see. And he said, why does he do this? Now he claims he's looking for love and affection and attention he never received as a child. Now he was raised by his grandparents. So he did get attention, just not from a mom and dad particularly. He pretended to be an orphan several times, not love and attention. He's a con artist who loves getting away with stuff and pulling things over people. You know, it's like, that's the fun part. So then this is where he got, this was the big deal though. A guy, this is a U.S. case, uh, Nicholas Barkley, age 13, went missing. He was seen playing basketball with his friends in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas, in 1994. He never got home, has never been seen since. So he was kidnapped as a 13-year-old. Uh, and um, now there's a few rare cases where a teenage boy has been found later uh, alive, and a couple teenage girls have been found alive. So with teenagers, there's a chance that they might survive. And there's a reason. Uh, toddlers, toddlers, little children, they're usually dead within an hour or two. Why? Because they're a pain in the butt to take care of. They cry. They pee on themselves. They whine. They're, they're difficult. They can't do anything for you. They're like a four-year-old. What's that four-year-old going to do for you? But a teenager, a 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old, you can, you can keep them in a prison in your house um, and they can they can have sex with you over and over again. You can you can get them to not cry. You can get them to do things. You can set up a little little place for them to live in with a you know a little TV set and stuff. You can make them wait on you. You know you can make them a servant, and they're much more pleasant to be around than a four year old. So so little children are killed usually within a couple hours. Teenagers have a chance of surviving. Um, most of them don't. If they've been kidnapped by a serial killer, they're usually dead also within a few hours. But a few of them have survived. So this kid was, uh, Nick Nicholas Barkley was 13 when he went missing. So there was a chance that maybe he could be alive. Um, Barkley never made it home, has not been seen since. In 1997, that's three years later, uh, Borden uh, took Barkley's identity and was flown to the United States. Although he had, had brown eyes and a French accent, <laughs> He convinced the family he was their blue-eyed son, saying he had escaped from a child prostitution ring and the ring had altered his eye color. And he lived with them for five months. 
before a private investigator who was working with a TV crew figured out that he was a fake. So what I find interesting is this. Why would the family believe this was their son when he has a French accent, his eye colors were wrong? That eventually the, the private investigator realized his ears didn't match. That's how he figured it out. Why would the family do this? Well, if anybody's seen my video on Johnny Gosh and his mom, mom still believes Johnny's alive. The little paper boy that got kidnapped, I I'm, I'm believe he's was dead within hours because he was a small child. But she still believes. And she says, oh, some guy showed up years later and said it was him and he was in a child prostitution ring. And she believes this. Bless her heart because she wants to believe her son is alive, no matter what. And saying you've been kidnapped into a child prostitution ring works really well. Because so many people believe there's these huge child prostitution rings, which are keeping children in tunnels and crap, you know, uh, <laughs> that it's one you can use. And that's what this guy used with, with these people who are desperate to have their son come back. And it's interesting because he was 13. Now, sometimes when your son, let's say your son, Johnny Gosh, was quite small. And he comes back 10 years later, 20 years later. You know, I don't know if I, if I had a kid, my kid disappeared when he was five, for example. And he came back at 25. I don't know that I would know what he would look like at 25 enough to not, you know, to be sure it wasn't him. But this kid disappeared at 13. And yet, three years later, just three years later, a kid shows up and says, I'm your son. They still think it's him. That's, that's how much parents who want their kids to be alive can delude themselves. That's, that's a delusion. They delude themselves because they just want it to be true so badly. And this is an entire family. Um, it's horrifically sad, just terribly sad that obviously the family's taken advantage of their 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 need to have this son be alive. And I'm sure when they finally found out it wasn't him, and he was a pretty good son while he was there. So they really liked him. Um, I want to read you a couple things from this guy, what he says. Um, let's see if this is one of them. Oh, so he says this, and this is interesting. The key is actually not lying about everything. Otherwise, you'll just mix things up. Keep it simple. A good liar uses the truth. And that is one thing that they do. They use things that they can comfortably talk about and just insert stuff that's not true. Um, let's see what he says here. Um, oh, no, no. Let me go here. Um, oh, okay. I want to go to this in a minute. So in a way, so he managed to convince them. Now he gets, he's free. Whatever reason, let's see what happened. He got six years. No, he got six years, twice as long as we were recommended. <laughs> I like that one. He returns to France in 2003, and he immediately assumes the identity of another 14-year-old boy has been missing. So you see, he, he's, he, he can't stop doing this. But anyway, he eventually meets and marries a woman, a French woman named Isabel, after a year-long courtship. Now, you have to wonder... What the heck? Why would she marry this guy who is as a con artist and is a well-known con artist? Now, here's what she says. Oh, sorry. That's not it. While I last saw him, okay, he married a French woman, Isabel, who he had met two years earlier. In her late 20s, Isabel was slim and pretty and soft-spoken. She was studying to be a lawyer. You would think a person studying to be a lawyer would look for a thing called facts. She, a victim of family abuse, so she claims. Uh, she had seen him on television describing his own abuse and his quest for love. Again, being a lawyer, you should know when you're being conned. And she had been so moved that she eventually tracked him down. I told him what interests me in his life wasn't the way he bent the truth, but why he did that and the things he looked for. So she didn't care that he was a con artist and he abused families of missing children, that he was a criminal. She just wanted, she just felt, felt for him because of why he would do these things. So she had a soft heart for him. Seriously. <laughs> Unbelievable. And she believed he, she could change him because she understood him. So she goes on to have five freaking children with him. Um, eventually, he claims in, in 2017 that she left him for another man, claiming she'd been unhappy for 10 years. Because <laughs> you're married to a con artist. Uh, he, she, he claims she left him with their children. The status of Isabel and the children is currently unknown. Well, let's hope they're not buried someplace. But one thing she thought was that he was because of her womanliness and her and her caring about his psychology, he she would help him. And here is always the truth. She was sure that he could change. She says, I've I've been with him now for two years and he's not that person. Oh, what happened to the thing I wanted to show? Wait, 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 wait. 
Wait, 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 it's gone. Ah, eh, crap. Um, he said, <laughs> let me see if I can find it here. He says, um, however, he says that I'm just the same guy I always was. And that's the truth. I was going to put up the quote, but he says, no, I didn't change. I'm, I am who I am. And so this is a, just a lesson for all of us. When you meet people and they tell you who they are and their behaviors show you who they are, believe them. That's who they are. They're not something else. They're not going to be something else. That's who they are. So don't don't risk your entire life on that. Um, fascinating, fascinating story. Um, really fascinating. Um, let's see. Um, I'm looking to see what your comments are. Um, <laughs> that's terrible. Where have you been, my blue-eyed son? Getting my 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 eyeballs changed. You know. <laughs> I mean, now you can do it with a you know contacts, but that they that the, the child for so the child abduction ring, the child pedophile ring, uh, it takes a 13-year-old boy and is going to somehow go to all the work to change his eye color. You know, yeah. Oh, the things people will believe because they want to believe. It's just sad. Really sad. <laughs> Good old Popeye. I am what I am. That's that's very, very, very true. And this is also true. Gullible women. And again, I'll point this out, though. Why? She was supposedly a fairly attractive, nice woman going to law, law degree, supposedly. Why would she not find herself someone or be, so, uh, be strong enough in herself to wait it out or not even be with anybody. Why would she go and be with a con artist? Because she suffers from needing the massive attention. She wants to be more special than a regular girl. And I, I stand by that because I've seen this happen over and over again, that when a person picks to be with a, a criminal, it's usually because they suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. They have to have that added, you're cool. You're amazing. You're special. You're different because a regular person isn't enough. And, I, I, and for example, I've even seen this. This drives me crazy. Um, and so this will be my last comment today because this is a dating thing. I saw this and I, I don't have it here, but I saw it. And the person was complaining that they are not a super attractive person. They're not gorgeous. Um, that even they're, they even might consider themselves ugly. And they said it's so frustrating because people don't want, I can't seem to get dates because people don't want to date me. Even though I have a great personality, I'm, I'm not even overweight, I have a good job, I have this, this, and this, and that. You know what I'm going to say? The problem is you're not willing to date somebody who looks like you. <laughs> so in other words, people don't want to be because I'm not attractive, but I don't want to be with that person because they're ugly. I don't want to be with that person because they're fat. I don't want to be with that person because he's a janitor and not a lawyer. So in other words, you're upset that people don't want to be with you, but you won't be with the people that you think aren't high enough to your standards. So it's like, maybe the problem is you think for whatever reason, just so whatever that you deserve to get anybody you want, like a rich person, a, a a super super attractive beauty queen it's like a guy who goes into a bar and he's like he's like a guy who's in his 50s and he's overweight and he's scruffy looking and he's all pissed off because the 20 year old girls don't want him right it's like okay what about the six what about the 50 year old woman sitting at the bar oh no i don't want her <laughs> she's too fat well she's the same fat as you well yeah but i don't like fat women okay so you want what you want is somebody to make you feel extra, extra amazing. In other words, they chose me because, not because I'm a regular human being. You know, not, it's like, hey, maybe we're both regular human beings and we could have a good life together, but oh no, that's not enough. I need somebody who I can br super brag about, even if they're criminals. <laughs> in other words, I'm with Joran van der Sloot. I get to be in the newspaper. I, I get people, media talking to me. I get to be with a guy who did these things. I'm so different and special because if I just go with the guy who set the, who sells empanadas, 
that on the stand, I'm a nobody. But you know, the empanada guy might be a really nice guy to be with for the rest of your life. But no, you want to go with the, this this character. So I think that's her problem too. She do, she didn't want to go with regular people. She wanted somebody so special that would raise her in her own strange mind to a special level, to a bigger level than being normal, being regular. So same thing with people who say, oh, I, nobody will date me. Well, maybe it's because you keep trying to date football players and cheerleaders, you know? <laughs> you know, maybe that is just not, you that's not the group you hang with. That's not, that's not the, that's, those, those aren't group people you are, you know, on the same social, social level with or whatever. Now there are times when people go from different, different status levels and happen to hook up and that's fine. But if that's the only level you look at and you like turn down everybody who's regular people, people that would definitely go out with you, they're not good enough for you. <laughs> you know, then there's a, a little problem there with a personality disorder, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> he might be the empanada killer. <laughs> he might be, but he hasn't been caught for that yet. Not for that, not yet. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, you're so special because you love a criminal, but he's a famous criminal. He's not just a dirtbag criminal. He's a famous criminal. There's a difference. You know, there, I mean, that's what, that's how Ted Bundy got his wife. Because he was Ted Bundy, not just because he was a low life loser, you know, that's a whole different matter. But yeah, it has to be it has to be enough of to love to bring that, even if it's a, a ridiculous thing, to bring that person to feel like they're more important than they they just not where they are now. It can't just be normal. And it's you know it's amazing to me because there are so many people who have had like um, disabilities, for example, let's say a person is, is blind. Um, there's some blind people who marry a person who isn't blind. They're like, well, like, well, I, well I, I should be able to marry a sighted guy. Well, you know, if a sighted guy and you fall in love, that's fine. But what do you, what do you have against other blind people? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, oh, that lowers me. I'm blind, but I'm not going to lower myself to marry a blind person. What the heck? That's just, that's just, what? You know, so, there are people who have had many dis kinds of disabilities who have, have their hearts open to other people who have similar si situations and they've made great lives together. And yes, sometimes people marry people without disabilities and it works out fine if it's natural. But there are those who say, well, I don't want somebody, I want somebody like I, I'm, uh, let's say I'm, uh, I don't know, I grew up in a regular neighborhood and I make $30,000 a year, but I don't want to marry a guy who makes $30,000 a year from the neighborhood. I only want to marry a guy who makes half a mil. But you don't make half a mil, so what are you talking about? <laughs> so you you raise your standards up to here, but he's supposed to, quote, lower his standards to there. See, that that's just, that's a, that's a, that's a disorder in your brain, a narcissistic disorder that says, I have to be that much more special. And that person is going to make me feel that much more special because I can't feel special if I'm with a person who's like me. <laughs> Why not? Can't you be special to regular people? I don't know. It's kind of, it's just fascinating. Yeah. yeah. A little person refuses another little person. It's just, again, if you fall in love with the person who's tall, that's fine. And they fall in love with you. Okay. But it's, you know, it's the same thing I say about people of, of different ages. Um, like, I think if you're like um, 70 and you won't date anybody over 50, you got a problem. You got a real massive ego problem. Now, if you're 70 years old and you happen to be playing golf and you run into a 50 year old and the two of you just hit it off and you end up being in a relationship, I don't have a problem with that. But if you only will date people under 50 when you're 70, I, that is an issue. <laughs> if you're only looking for people who are rich when you're not. That's an issue. So, yeah. But I say, if it just happens, it happens. But if you won't let, if you just have a very small box, which you accept people from, hmm, that's problematic. Um, oh, I don't remember that one. Um, the kiss book, what is that? Uh, Benny says, 
I was doing a special assignment out of Kiss Before Dying. Good book, bad movie. <laughs> True psychopath. Oh, I'm trying to remember if I've seen that one. I'm not sure. Well, 58, I won't date anyone younger than me. You know, again, if you if you ran into somebody for whatever reason, she just hit it off. But the same thing is if you met somebody who's 78 and you hit it off, that's fine. But in, in reality, probably staying closer to your age is more reasonable and, and more successful. So you might as well just stick there. <laughs> well, well that that's that's absolutely true you know i mean we all have dis we all have some level of disabilities and we hope that people people understand us but if we say i won't look i'm having i'm having problem with my eyesight i don't want a married guys gotta wear glasses <laughs> but you know it's yeah <laughs> you just woke up well sorry to say but we're about to close out now um yeah, it's uh, the end of this. Uh, I'm going to go eat my dinner and then I'm going to do the other show that I said I put up tonight for Sarah, for Sarah. So anyway, um, <laughs> so glad you were all here tonight. Um, just so many interesting a variety of topics that people threw into me tonight. So I thought they were all quite fascinating. Um, and I'm going to talk about it, say a little more of Othodio do with the, the Shana case um, and what Jose Bias, I think, is going to do with that. I think he's going to use it. That, that's my opinion. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see how that comes out. Um, but uh, thank you for being here. And I think I'll try to do the ending of my show better than the beginning of my show. <laughs> so goodbye, everybody. If you're new here, please do like and subscribe. Bye. <music>